I do hereby swear to be faithful to the Republic of South Africa. And I solemnly and sincerely promise that we will always promote all that will advance the Republic and oppose all that may happen. Be a true and faithful counselor, discharge my duties with all my strength and talents to the best of my knowledge. And true to the details of my conscience, to justice to all. And devote myself to the well-being of the Republic and all of its people. So help me God. 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 1994 was a remarkable year for South Africa, the dawn of democracy. It ushered in political and social transformation and changed the country forever. That was 30 years and five presidents ago. Three decades later, South Africans will return to voting stations on the 29th of May. Some 28 million registered voters will have the power to make their mark and exercise their right to vote by electing representatives to both national parliament and provincial legislatures. This will be our country's seventh democratic election. Some believe South Africa is facing its most unpredictable election in a post-apartheid era, and it's been described as a defining moment in not only our history, but for our nation. In this mini-podcast series, the Jack Rand FM news team will tell the story of the 2024 elections. We will have it all, from expert analysis to hearing from you, the voter. Political opinions play a crucial role in the world we live in, and it's also necessary for a thriving democracy. This is the Jacaranda FM news team taking you on the journey to the 2024 polls with insights on, among others, the challenges first-time voters face, South Africa's political landscape and how it plays a role on the global stage. The story of South Africa's liberation struggle cannot be told without alluding to the integral role of women. 30 years into democracy, South African politics still has a predominantly male face. Even though, according to the latest stats, women make up 51% of South Africa's population of 60 million. Similarly, women constitute more than 50% of the country's over 27 million registered voters. Yet the closest we've been to having a female president in South Africa is when Baleka Mbeti was deputy president between 2008 and 2009, before her Pumzile Mlambunuka held the position for three years between 2005 and 2008. Our reporter Masse Chaba Sefalaro reflects on the role of women in politics since the dawn of democracy by speaking to the woman at the forefront of politics by asking the question, is the dream of a female president just that, a dream? An extract from the preamble of the Women's Charter for Effective Equality, as reviewed by the National Women's Coalition, reads, South Africa is poorer politically, economically and socially for having prevented more than half of its people from fully contributing to its development. Recognizing our shared oppression, women are committed to seizing this historic moment to ensure effective equality in a new South Africa. Stellenbosch University's Professor Amanda Hose takes us back to when women demanded they place at the table. So we ask for a 30% quota. And it was the ANC Women's League who took up this matter with the ANC. And it was a struggle because the men at first did not want to have a 30% quota. But it was then agreed. And in the 1994 freedom election, there was a 30% quota for women. But we still managed to get about 111 women into parliament in in that first election. That quota was actually increased in 2009 after President Zuma became the president to a 50% quota. So at this point, we have 45% women in parliament because the other parties don't have quotas and they bring the average down. The South African Rainbow Alliance, or SARA, describes itself as a pact of like-minded minority parties, churches, civic and faith-based organizations. Organizations. These include the National Freedom Party and the Independent Citizens Movement, for example. It's led by former City of Joburg speaker and ousted Coke member Colleen Makubele, who laments media's portrayal of women as incapable of holding leadership roles and the issue of funding. You find a man, a male politician, goes and calls 2,000 people in a town hall 
and have a manifesto launch, every TV station will be there covering that. And we've complained about that. Two, what is it that is really a challenge to us? It's funding. You find male parties are well-funded. Some men that have not even set foot in a campaign trail, they left corporate, they went into this politics, they came in with almost 100 million, some 15 million in the bag. These people have not even been tested as political leaders. I came from being a speaker of the city of Johannesburg. I've been, at least to a certain extent, tried and tested as a political leader one who was uh, uh, serving at the highest level in the city in a political office. You look at competence and qualifications. I can and other women as well can match any man that stands on the front. We even have better qualifications and credentials, both in politics, in corporate, where we've been in business, you know, where I've been as well, busy with my PhD in management of innovation and technology as well, with vast experience that I can stand against anybody. You mentioned them, Stian Hazen, whether it's your Likota, whether it's your Mashaba, anyone. We can sit and debate issues of policy and anything. Why is it that women leaders are not taken seriously? Qualifications. Let's take one step back to the ANC. 30 years since the adoption of the Women's Charter, Nanleba Mhlaudi is a recognizable name in the organization, being one of three under 35s elected onto the governing party's National Executive Committee at the ANC's 55th National Conference. She holds a master's degree in African Language Studies, and according to her, she's also a PhD candidate. But Mhlaudi admits, in a patriarchal society like ours, she battles unprovoked sexism and misogyny. I experience more slut-shaming on social media from people who don't even know me because of the fact that I'm in the NEC of the ANC, therefore I slept my way there. I get called all certain things because I have a particular job and it's said that it's because I'm a woman and therefore I'm associated with so-and-so, forgetting the fact that I actually have three degrees and I'm a PhD candidate. I could be wrong, but I'm saying because people know you and know where you are in society, it actually... All of the work you've done, it gets completely discounted. It's very upsetting to work so hard every day. And then someone who doesn't even know who you are will say, hi, wait till she got the job, she's on the list of parliament because of X, Y, and Z. Mslauli says the ANCs realize the elevation of women into leadership roles through its quota policy, which she says is still relevant. You know, people will always say, yeah, but it's just quotas. It's never just quotas because a quota means representation and representation means that there's a voice and then when there's a voice it means that there's activism and there's an activism that means that there's advocacy when there's advocacy that means that there's policy change and that's what we've seen with the struggle for for the emancipation of women are we where we want to be or where we ought to be no we are not the democratic alliance's sivire guahube holds a strategic role as the official opposition's chief whip in parliament her party has been criticized for its dismissal of quotas but she explains that this in itself takes away from the credibility of women leaders rather than building it. I think for me the big was quotas and even the agenda quota system is that you start to perpetuate the notion that sometimes women are in decision-making positions or around the decision-making table on the basis of quotas. And I think the only focusing on quotas is essentially only fixing the outcome and not essentially fixing the root of the problem. The root of the problem is not how many people, how many seats we have to fill at the leadership level, and we have to count. You know, we have four men, therefore we need to have four women. The root of the problem is that you've got to substantively make sure that women are empowered enough and that women are included enough in your organization by changing the organizational culture to make sure that women rise up the ranks. Bold One South Africa's deputy leader and Gauteng Premier candidate Nobuntu Klaus Webster believes even the separation of women from the mother body through structures such as a women's league weakens the battle for equal representation. When we started the party, everywhere I went, the woman would say, when are we starting our women's league? When are we starting our women's chapter, as Bold One would say? And I have always maintained that I, I wouldn't want for us to start a women's league or a women's chapter yet because what then happens is that the women all gather around in that, in that women's league and in that women's chapter and they take uh, positions of leadership there, but they're not well represented in structures and in leadership within the party. And, you know, it, to some degree, you know, they'd be like, we want to go lead in the women's league. And I'd say, no, lead here. 
lead in the main structures of the party, take positions up in leadership in the party, and they have, because we've insisted that women must lead in the mainstream of the party. Makubele agrees. You know, those women's league and youth league, they mirror the patriarchal society that we are trying to dismantle right now. And they, they have to reinforce that kind of a notion that these are support by the way structures, you know, uh, that must support the main body, which is made up of men. And in those days, why they had those things, we must go back and understand it. It's because it was only the men at the forefront of fighting the struggle. And the women needed some formation on the side to deal with their issues and how they support the men. And, you know, and I always come up with this, women are not support structure. We are integrated. We are one. The minute you have a women's league, you are saying the women's issue is a separate one. It must be dealt with in a special forum, etc. No. Women issues are the main issues. Youth issues are the main issues. All of us sit around the table together. There must be generational mix, gender parity. There must be everybody. People's disability must be part of what we are doing. So the minute we all sit around the table, have policies that serve us, that are one, and you've seen the Women's League in ANC has been absolutely irrelevant. It has made no impact into the changing of the patriarchal structure, no impact in changing the leadership of this country, no impact in championing the women issue. But you've got women in parliament, you've got Women's League there. 2024 is our 1994, says the new kid on the block, Raisa Mzansi, and that statement has resonated with many across party lines, given that this has been described as the most historic election since the advent of democracy. Razam Zanzi's national chairperson and Gauteng premier candidate, Vui Swara Mokhoba, elaborates on how her party has sought to ensure representation. We use uh, what, you know, what they call the zebra process. In other words, having every second person on the list being a woman. And that's across all provinces. And factoring in, obviously, merit and their actual credentials, etc. So that becomes a mechanical way to ensure that you have the representation that you want. Uh, without obviously compromising the quality of candidates that you put forward. These are some of the interventions that we've particularly put in. But I think what's also important is that the culture of politics. And we have been also very deliberate about having and embedding a culture within the organization and within the way we do politics that gives women space and an opportunity to lead, to make their voices heard, and to um, contribute in a way that gets recognized. And I think that's really, really the most important part. If your politics is all about combat and people screaming at each other and fighting with each other, that tends to repel a lot of women. And and, and that's not necessarily the politics that's attractive. And so it becomes more challenging to, to, to make yourself heard in that type of space. And so we've been very clear that we want to create a conducive environment for young people, for women, and for people with disabilities and anyone who's it goes beyond being invited to sit at the table and being heard, says Kwahube, but the whole house should be inviting. In other words, spaces such as parliament should be conducive environments for women politicians to thrive. But they aren't. 400 members of parliament are there making laws. There is no real provision for members of parliament who are young women of childbearing age to bring their children into work. There's no crash facilities, there's no baby rooms, there's no rooms for women to go and express or feed. There are no facilities. The entire parliament was never built with a woman in mind. And so we as women who walk into that space, you realize that, well, I mean, this is an entirely hostile place for me to exist. We have to, in spite of our political persuasion, and this is the big criticism that I have with us as women in politics in particular, is that there are things that ought to unite us across party lines. And the issues around how do we create workspaces that are not only supportive to women, but also make them doing their job conducive is where we, we get it wrong. We allow the harshness of party political lines to separate us, even actually when we should be saying, well, let's walk into parliament and demand that this space be designed differently. And that's something that I'm really hoping that in the seventh parliament, we can be a lot more intentional about across party lines, that as we are rebuilding parliament number one, is that we make sure that that parliament is incredibly friendly to women who are of childbearing age. Younger women are getting into politics. So back to the question we first started with. 
Should we still keep dreaming of having a woman president? I definitely see us having a woman president in the next decade. So if you look at all of the parties, for example, the ANC, three out of the, the top seven leadership of the ANC are women. If you look at the DA, the chief whip of the DA is a woman. In actual fact, I think the most powerful politician in the DA, Helen Zilla, is a woman. These are just examples that I'm making that I think that there's a lot of women who are influential in their various parties to such an extent that in the next decade, you definitely want to see a woman at the helm of a political party. It's absolutely attainable. Look, we may not get a woman president in this election, but we certainly have women who are in key positions leading up to this election. We have women who are in critical positions. We have more women who are um, at the forefront. It may not be possible for the 29th of May, but certainly going towards 2029, we have to work much harder. It's sad because even women Mm -hmm. themselves vote for men. I think the conversation has taken on a much more urgent tone, and that is what I'm encouraged by. Does it come to bear after the 29th of May? All bets would likely say no. But I think what it does is it certainly paves a route towards potentially the next election and even the upcoming elections in terms of local elections and really scrutinizing who's on those lists, who is leading those municipalities. You know, I think we we do tend to focus quite a lot on that one seat called a president, forgetting that there are many other roles of leadership that are critical to the functioning of our society. And we should equally be advocating for women to be leading and to be present and driving in those portfolios. Until you see women in positions of power, you know, where women can see there, there's a woman, she makes a difference. It's going to be very difficult to shift that mindset. It's a catch-22, right? You need the women to make the change, but you can't get the women until you have to change. I think that when young people are looking at this next election, number one, they must realize that this is our democracy. As young people in particular, as young women in particular, we have a lot of skin in the game. And if we don't participate and essentially force politicians to change and force political parties to change, we're not going to get the results that we want. We're going to constantly be shackled with a country that we don't recognize, with a leadership that we don't resonate with. Therefore, it's in our power as voters, as the electorate, as young people, to force political parties, punish parties that don't evolve. Let's leave the last word to Madiba. Speaking in Parliament in May 1994, soon after he became South Africa's first democratic president, Nelson Mandela said, Freedom cannot be achieved unless the women have been emancipated from all forms of oppression. Elections 24, The Power of Your Ex, is an original jackpot podcast brought to you by Jacaranda FM News. Jacaranda FM cannot be held responsible for the views and comments expressed in this podcast. Follow Jacaranda FM News on Facebook and X or go to jacarandafm.com and click on News. Listen to more episodes and the original series at jacarandafm.com. Click on Jackpot or on the apps where you can get all your other podcasts.